it is a huge honor today to be talking to uh, an expert, if not probably the only the only expert I know who does this full time, and that is uh, you have an MBA, a CPA. I don't even know what a CMA, CFE, CFF is, but basically, long story short, you you've built your entire life and career on, on embezzlement That's true. in dentistry. That's right. And uh, I think that um, I think it's an emotional problem because a, a lot of dentists. Um, I, I, I think the um, the ones I've talked to that found out someone embezzled them. I don't think it really was so much the money. It was just the violation of their emotional trust. They can't believe this right hand person that they had in their office for 15 years who they went to their daughter's baptism and he went to their mother's funeral. And it was just they had this beautiful, loving, respecting relationship for 15 years. And he found out he was she was stealing from him and it just emotionally crushed him. Do you, do you, do you think do you, do you think the issue is more financial or emotional turmoil that somebody violated you the emotional part is certainly very real Howard um, yes you're absolutely right every embezzler every embezzlement victim who I've ever talked to has that feeling of violation you know they've trusted somebody and and, and then that person leveraged that trust into a theft um, on the other hand money can be important too and I've seen embezzlements of, of close to two million dollars take place uh, and I don't care how much you're invested emotionally in somebody that's a heck of a lot of money but, but most people that just heard that say you can't you can't steal two million dollars when someone only has forty dollars in their wallet how, but uh but so so let, let, let's back up all the way to the beginning who's right. david harris and how did you become an embezzlement expert and why did you pick dentistry uh i didn't really pick dentistry at all dentistry picked me uh a very long is that time. because you're bald and handsome like me or is that why they picked us i'm pretty sure we just got lucky in life. And we got lucky in life. Um, you know, it was 1989. I was uh, doing investigations for a bank. I left my job. I was sitting home kind of wondering what was going to happen. And the phone rang. And it was a dentist friend of mine. And he said, I think my front desk person's stealing from me. And I really don't know where to go with this other than you. So I... I I really had nothing going on that week, so I said, okay, okay, I'll meet you at your office after, uh, after hours tonight, we'll sort it out. So I did, and this was back in the days of pegboard, in other words, before people were using practice management software. We found out what she was doing, fired her, uh, the doctor promised to buy me dinner that he never did, um, my, my introduction to the tight-fistedness of the dental profession, but um, that's okay. And I went back to watching TV and I didn't think anything more of this until two weeks later. Two weeks later, I was going into my own dentist's office for an appointment. And I was about to go through the front door of his office and I looked through the glass and I saw sitting there the same woman that we fired at the other place two weeks earlier. I turned around, hoping that she didn't see me. I sprinted to the nearest payphone called the doctor's office. Fortunately, this was before most people had call display in their businesses. Um, identified myself as a local orthodontist because I knew I had to get past the gatekeeper. Got the dentist on the phone and said, hi, it's not Dr. Jensen, it's David Harris. I'm the guy who's supposed to be in your chair right now. And obviously, you know, I'm not, but let me tell you why. And I told him about the time bomb that was ticking away at his front desk. And he asked me in this panicked voice, what the heck do I do now? And about halfway through my second sentence, he'd hired me. So that's how I got started. And no, that was 1989. 1989. No big business plan, no burning desire to deal with dentists for the rest of my life. Um, but that's how I started. So you've been, have you, you've been doing dentistry for, for 26 years. That's right. So I want to I ask you some just off the cuff uh, things. Um, what percent of dentists? Right, right now my my, my average episode is about seven thousand dentists. So yeah. seven thousand dentists are going to hear this. How many of those seven thousand are being embezzled from right now? Rough numbers, probably about four hundred or five hundred. 
And what percentage is that? I asked you a question. Don't you know the answer? What's what's five hundred out of seven? Was that a percent? What what's what's the percent yeah, you're looking uh, at? Probably somewhere in in the ballpark of six to eight percent of of dentists are being embezzled today. And do you have? Are, are there any red flags? I mean, from twenty six years of doing this, I mean, talk talk. I, I'm sure you know. Um, there's a lot of them, but what, what what are the main red flags? What, what what first of all, and if someone's thinking they're being embezzled, can they contact the man? Absolutely. And how do they contact you? Uh, they can uh, send me an email, and uh, my email, my personal email, is david at dentalembezzlement dot com. And uh, I know that most of your audience is highly literate, but in case they're not, I'll point out that embezzlement has two Z's. Um, <laughs> Sometimes people have spelled it wrong and it, and it didn't work properly. Okay. Uh, David so at they, embezzlement.com, or if they go to www.dentalembezzlement.com, you got a contact button there. Uh, can, asked, can they call you? Sure. And, what, and What's your number? Uh, Toll free number is 888 398 2327. Say it one more time 888 398 2327. Okay, so my. my my fans of this show are mostly commuters, and you would. And when you think of commuters, you're probably thinking of someone has to drive an hour across Toronto or LA. But most of them are rural. They got 70 mile drives across the plains of Nebraska. Talk to this person. They're in their car driving to work. What are? Why should they? What? What should alarm them? What? What? What are red flags where they should say, "Damn"? Because I. And, and is it someone that you usually trust? Is it someone that you're usually suspicious of? I mean, is it someone who, you know, is there any, you know, is there, just just talk about profiling Absolutely. to make them wonder what the hell is going on. Absolutely. Two kinds of embezzlers. Uh, the first kind is a serial embezzler. And the serial embezzler is somebody who's done this before and you make a hiring mistake and you end up with them in your office. Um, the and, and I think, Howard, when a lot of people think about embezzlers, this is the mental picture they have. You know, somebody who's a little bit sociopathic, who, as I say, has done this maybe once, maybe three times, and, and they just slip through your, your due diligence process. Because they don't do due diligence. They, so, what, so what should they have done? Should, when you, before you hire someone, should you, what, have Googled them? Should you have done, called, what, what, what would have prevented uh, you from- the, the, like that, Dennis had hired that lady that you'd already busted on the office for. What could he have done? What should he have done at the interview that she wouldn't have made it in there? Uh, he probably should have been a little better at fo- phoning former employers. But and is she going to list a former employer that fired her for embezzling? No, she isn't. But that's what that's where the doctor has to be a little bit skeptical. And, and Howard, I don't want to take too much time talking about serial embezzlers because where I was going with this is that they're in the vast major- minority of embezzlers. In other words, about 15% of our case files involve one of those serial embezzlers. 85% involve the person you just described, the long-term employee, you've been to their daughter's wedding, and they come in one day and start stealing. With the serial embezzlers, um, you, the, the, thing I, the, the observation I'd make is this. I've asked a lot of doctors over the years, do you enjoy hiring people? None of them do. They absolutely hate that part of <laughs> their life. And as soon as somebody throws them a lifeline, and a lifeline in this case is somebody who, who appears perfect for the job, every ounce of skepticism just vanishes from their brain. And the thought that they should check references, or let me throw out a radical concept here, ask prospective employees for a drug test, is just the furthest thing from their mind. What is in their mind is, thank God I found somebody and I can stop this horrible process of hiring. Um, What we need to do though when we're hiring somebody is we need to reconstruct their resume a little bit independently. How do you do that? Well, they must have some former employer. When you talk to that person, first of all, don't ever call any phone number an applicant gives you. If they say that they work for Dr. Ferran in Phoenix, go to Google or uh, your favorite search engine, find the phone number of the office and call that phone number and then you know who you're really talking to. We've seen cases where somebody has parked one of those disposable cell phones with a relative somewhere who answers and pretends to be the former employer. Okay, so first tip. Second tip is when I get you on the line and I'm, and I'm asking you about Susie who's applying for a job at my office, some questions I should ask you. 
Um, who did Susie work for before she started with you, Howard? And when she left you, where did she go? The other thing I should do is ask you an open-ended question about employment dates. In other words, rather than saying to you, Susie said she worked for you from this date to this date, can you please confirm? What I should be saying is, Howard, can you please give me Susie's start date and end date? And I'm going to compare those to the resume and I'm going to see if they're the same thing. If they're not, she's hiding a job. There's some other employer she doesn't want me to talk to. So when I ask you about who was the previous employer and who was the subsequent employer, again, I'm looking for things that I can bring home and compare to the resume and find a discrepancy. And if you say, well, after she worked for me, she went to work for Dr. Jones in uh, Scottsdale. And I don't see Dr. Jones on the resume anywhere. My next call is going to be to Dr. Jones, and I'm probably going to have to hold the phone out here because I'm going to get an earful about Susie. The other question I should always ask a former employer, and I is a simple one, but I, I try to keep it very unambiguous. The question I would say to you is, Howard, if you had a job that Susie was qualified for, and if Susie was available, would you rehire her? And if the answer to that is anything other than, yes, absolutely, of course, I should run the other way. So when we're, when we're trying to keep serial embezzlers out, we want to confirm exact dates of employment from former employers. We want to ask about continuity on the resume, and we want to ask if you'd rehire. Okay. When we're dealing with current staff, because these ones are the bigger dangers. What do you call them? Current employees. Okay, okay current okay. serial embezzlers, and that's 15%. Then current employees is the other uh, 85%. Exactly. When we're dealing with those people, what I would tell your audience is that they can probably improve at spotting the type of behavior that employees exude when they're embezzling. Simple example, most embezzlers do not want to take vacation because embezzlement requires control over the flow of information in the office and they can only exert that control if they're there. Um, embezzlers will come in early or stay late or come in on the weekend because typically they want alone time in the office to steal. And if you think about particularly the front desk, and embezzlement is not confined to front desk employees, but uh, for most people who work at the front desk, their day is really a series of interruptions. And it's hard to get enough concentration um, to be able to do something for, for 20 minutes, and, it's, and that's typically what embezzlement takes. So they need alone time. They will come in at 6 o'clock in the morning, or they'll stay late, or they'll come back after hours. That's how they get it. So that's something that we absolutely want to watch for. We are also looking for territoriality. So we have people who don't want to share their job. They don't want to cross-train somebody else to do their work. Uh, it may take a little more subtle form, like they may not want the office to upgrade its practice management software to a new version. And the reason is because they have some game that's working with EagleSoft 15 and they're concerned that if they upgrade to EagleSoft 17, that whatever they're doing is going to be shut down. So they will they will discourage that. And we understand that nobody really enjoys change, but the reaction here can be stronger. Um, another, another thing that you will see embezzlers do is that they will discourage the doctor from hiring a consultant. Because embezzlers know they can fool the doctor. That's not terribly hard in general. Um, but somebody who consults in many offices is probably a lot bigger challenge. So those are some of the things. There's, there, there's a longer list, and actually I was going to make an offer to your audience. Uh, we have a questionnaire that's available on our website, and it's called the Embezzlement Risk Assessment Questionnaire. It's 35-odd questions, takes about 10 minutes. Um, we we normally charge for it, but we decided this summer to uh, make it available to people at no charge. Did you ever start a thread with that? 
Um, no, but it's a great idea. What, what, what's the name? Of, what's the name of thirty-one? What, what's what's the title of it? It's the embezzlement risk assessment questionnaire. Will you? What I want you to do is <clears throat> start a thread under uh, finance or whatever, and call it the uh, what do you call it? The embezzlement risk assessment questionnaire, ERAC for short. ERAC risk assessment questionnaire, and it's thirty-one questions. Uh, or, or the, how many? The current version is thirty-five. Ten minutes to complete. Yeah. Um, why don't you start a thread and say, please uh, take the or, or how are, and then and then what I can also do is then I can post this uh, this video on that thread also. So then they can take the questionnaire and then get that rolling. Then I'll put this video up there um, because my, my, what I like about Dental Town is that nobody has to ever practice solo again. So there can be a community. And thank you for posting. Uh, you've posted like 40 times. You haven't done a Dental Town CE course. I'm going to try to throw you under a bridge and get you to put that up. I really wish you would do that because this is a, this is one of those big fear to do lists because I, I think that Dennis is not only is he feels emotionally taken advantage of. You know, you love someone, you trusted them. Um, now they they they've used that against you. And they just spend so much time learning how to do an implant and a root canal and a bone graft. They just never really take the time to learn the CE. So I'm going to go back on your on your deal. Well, do you want to go over those 35 questions? Um, I, I, I think there are probably more productive things we can talk about. Oh, okay. So what would be the next productive? Um, so is there any profiling? Is it older versus younger, blondes versus brunettes, boys, girls? Um, religious, non-religious, is there um, anything, any th any profiles that you've picked up in 26 years? I mean, you know a bald guy would never do it. You know an Irish person would never do it. So who's doing this? Um, well, I'll, I'll answer that in a couple of ways. First well, let of me all, just ask you to point out, have you ever had a short, fat, bald Irish Catholic guy caught embezzling? Yes. No, you have not. Yes, I have. Really? Okay, well then, it, then, it, that. then at that point it's open to anybody. But have you seen any profiles? Uh, for sure. There is no demographic profile. In other words, the embezzler could be anyone. The majority of embezzlers that we see in dental offices are female, but that... But that's because 99% of the employees are female. That's it. Um, you know, if, and, and, and to the extent that there are male employees, there are, there are male embezzlers as well. Um, Embezzlers are predominantly front desk staff, but not exclusively. What percent would be front desk and what would be next? Hygienist, assistants, laptop. What percent uh, is front desk? From, from what we see, it is it is probably uh, 90 to 95% front desk. And of those 90 to 95% front desk, what percent of those were the office manager? Is it usually the top dog? Uh, it is frequently the top dog. Um, Probably, and I'm and I'm throwing out a statistic because honestly we haven't studied this. Subjectively, um, seventy to eighty percent would be the top dog, uh, and and the balance would be somebody else in the office. Um, and how many times is it someone working solo versus someone who's got another receptionist in on it? Two people handing me this. Um, the, the, there are, there are two kinds of multi-person fraud. The first one is collusive fraud. So in a, in a collusive fraud, it's as you described. You have um, two people who are who are combining to steal. Uh, we see that one, I, I honestly don't have any good numbers on it. It's, it's more common than people think. The one thing I'll say about collusive fraud though is that normally these two people have some kind of relationship outside the office. So it might, you know, one that we see sometimes is it's a, it's a mother and daughter or, or two siblings who are combining to steal. And, and as a thief, and, and full confession time, a long, long time ago I used to be one, the biggest risk that you can take is going to somebody else and saying, I'm embezzling from Howard and I think you should as well. I mean, that's a, that's a huge risk and, and you would only do that if you really knew the other person very well. So there's normally some kind of linkage that they have outside the office. So you say you used, you used to do this yourself. Is that how you kind of got into it? So back you, in my teens, yeah. Uh, back in your teens? Wasn't very good at it. Got caught quickly. Um, decided that uh, a life change was in order, and, and, and I've uh, flown pretty straight ever since. 
but I do remember the thought process. And actually, when we hire investigators, that's what we're looking for. You know, they obviously have a dental background. I mean, everybody who works at Prosperity has been uh, has worked in a dental office or has has worked with dentists for a long period of time. But then the next question is how well they can anticipate what a thief would do in a given situation. Um, interesting statistic, and I didn't realize this until a couple of weeks ago. Fully 20% of the people who work here have at least one parent who's a dentist. Wow. How's that for a neat stat? That, that is a neat stat. So then what would be the next most productive thing to talk about this? Um, well, actually prevention. How? Or what, where did you want to go with this? You've been doing this 26 well, years. I, I, I'm let, probably let, not smart enough to even ask questions. Let's talk a little bit more about profile. Um, <clears throat> A little bit more about profile, if we could, and because I'm thinking, I'm thinking, um, it's a woman, and she's she's desperate. She's got two or three kids. Her husband left her. He won't pay the child support. And desperate people do desperate things. And yeah, I have four boys. And if that meant to feed them, I had to steal. I'd, I'd steal to feed my four boys. Is it desperate people? That's that's part of it. Uh, we we do see desperate thieves, and and that's exactly the label we put on them. And it's as you described, you know, at some level of financial pressure, everybody's ethics become pliable, and 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 that's what these people are doing. There's another group though, and that group I would call the greedy, and they're not stealing because they have to. They're stealing because to them it feels good. Uh, and I'll give you a great example. We we did an investigation a couple of years ago. Uh, there was a woman who was stealing, and then she won $3 million in the state lotto. And after she did that, she kept stealing. So it wasn't about money at that point. It was about her getting some kind of biochemical satisfaction from stealing the way that a runner gets runner's high, and she wanted it. I'd pay $3 million just to be able to get the runner's high. Well... <laughs> You know, Do they have an operation for that yet? <laughs> um, it's called cocaine. <laughs> I need a brain transplant. I, I, uh, but um, so so what? So more on the profile. So these people, typically, they're very smart. They feel underappreciated by their dentist. You know, they kind of they kind of wait for the dentist to to say to them one day, "Oh my gosh, I've been so stupid." You know, you are of tremendous value to this practice, and I'm going to double your salary today. They wait for that conversation to happen, and they wait, and they wait, and it doesn't happen, and finally they just take matters into their own hands. And they, as I say, feel underappreciated, and, and this is their way of addressing it. So they're a lot more dangerous than the other group, because you can, you can spot the desperate people. I mean, you, you know, when you look at the people in your office, you know who's typically in, in, in financial trouble. Um, but... These people aren't. The other difference is the desperate people, when they when they steal, they're using the money to pay the mortgage or buy groceries. When the greedy people are stealing, they flaunt it. Uh, we've we've seen thieves who bought a hundred and forty thousand dollar BMW. You know, which seems a little untoward for some for somebody who overtly is being paid sixty thousand dollars a year. Uh, or they buy the big boat. Or uh, in one case, they. Uh, flew six of their girlfriends to a to New York for a shopping weekend. You know, it's 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 stuff at that level, and they are conspicuously consuming. So that's the other profile. Uh, both of these typically are long service employees. They've been with you for forever. Uh, you trust them, and of course, that's a huge enabling mechanism, isn't it? And we've all heard that. Um the uh, the wife who's deciding to divorce you and puts it on hold because she's siphoning off thousands of dollars a month. And uh, I, I know one dentist who the they went on a vacation to Sydney and she Australia and she actually had set up a bank account when he was down there and she thought she was out shopping and she was done at that point and she siphoned off for like six years before she filed for divorce. So is is that very common? Um, I, usually it's a little bit shorter term phenomenon than that. Um, a, a lot of spouses of, of dentists, you know, and let's, let's assume that this is a spouse without uh, a lot of independent earning ability, you know, they, they, they decide one day that they can't live with their, with their dentist spouse, and they're terrified. Um, you know, they, at, at that point, when they say to their spouse, I'm leaving you, 
uh, unless they have independent finances, they're, they're placing their hands in the, in the divorce court system, which is very scary. And typically their attorney has said to them something along the lines of, I'm not going to tell you how to do this, but I'm going to tell you that your life will be a lot easier if you have some money under the mattress. Uh, and then they, they see embezzlement as the way to do that. Uh, I've also seen a case, to, to kind of turn this around a little bit, um, this was two doctors in a group practice. Uh, one of them was stealing from the other one. And his accomplice was somebody working at the front desk who he was having an extramarital affair with, to whom he had said, you know, as soon as we get enough money set aside, I can leave my wife. Uh, I'm not sure whether he had any real intention to do that, but he was he was using this front desk person as as his dupe. We I, to help we, him steal. I I've heard people say on Dental Town talking about this that um one thing that uh, embezzlers do is they try to have something to hold against you. So uh, so if you're married to a woman and it will cost you a bit lot of money to get divorced, and I'm stealing from you to hedge my bet, I'm going to start screwing you too. Because if you ever bust me, then I'm going to say, shut up and go away, or I'm going to tell your wife about the whole day. Is, is that common or not common? It absolutely is. Uh, that, that's one form of it. The other form is if the dentist is cutting some kind of ethical corner in the office. So they're not collecting insurance co-pays. Or um, they're, they're over-treating people, or they're, they're, they're somewhere, somewhere cutting a corner. That is also handing the embezzler a get-out-of-jail-free card. We see a lot of embezzlers who turn around and report their doctor to the state board. And sometimes it's probably justified. Sometimes I think it's just trying to give the doctor a bigger problem than, than, than the embezzler. Um, but absolutely, that happens. Yeah, so, and then there, the substance abuse issue. You know, if a dentist is uh, abusing uh, nitrous or uh, ordering uh, hydrocodone or she, she's got what, – what percent of the time do you think – She's got a get out of jail card. I got something against you, and I'm going to open up your closet and show all the skeletons if you catch me. That's a good question, and and again, it's something we haven't really studied. Um, I'll I'll do the dangerous thing and give one of my off the cuff statistics. I'm <laughs> thinking it's probably about twenty percent of the time. Okay, one in five. Okay, eighty twenty the eighty twenty rule. Okay. So where did you want to go next to this? Because you you know this material better than I do. I don't want to I don't want to lead you down a non productive interview, what, where would you want to go next? Do you want to go prevention? Do you want to go, or what, what do you want to talk about? Let, let, let's talk about a couple of things. Prevention first, and then uh, maybe we should, we should finish with telling people what to do, and probably, more importantly, what not to do if they, if they suspect that they have a problem. Um, here's the problem with prevention, and, and unfortunately, I think a lot of dentists um, misunderstand the problem. Um, what most people do when they when they think about embezzlement is they want to analogize from other types of crime. Um, you know, and they the, 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 the thing that they will see is the burglar alarm. So everybody has this idea that if we make it hard for somebody to steal in our office, they will not try. And a lot of what's been written about prevention, which I disagree with quite strongly, is around the concept of making the practice a harder target. Um, for example, Howard, you will see a lot of people advise a doctor that you really should make the bank deposit yourself. And I'm, I'm sure you've seen that advice. I've seen it on Dental Town. Um, and what somebody's thinking is, you know, we will, we will stop an embezzler from stealing money out of your bank deposit. And let's assume for a moment that you have somebody in your practice who's already decided that stealing from Howard is the right thing to do. And their first plan is to take money out of your bank deposit, but you frustrate that by making the deposit yourself. What you're left with at that point is somebody who has said, I'm okay to steal from Howard, and they can't do it that way. Are they going to give up? Of course not they're going to look at what other possibilities they have in stealing from you. To give you a number, we've cataloged about 300 different ways to steal from a dentist, and we're not done. Well, look at the United States. They made drugs illegal, and go and have three, one million people in jail for drugs, and I could buy anything in Phoenix in an hour. 
Of course you can. And that's just buying gas at Circle K. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not hard. Um, you know, again, people assume that that something like a burglar alarm will work in a dental office. Uh, when you think about what alarms do, though, they don't prevent crime. They divert it to another victim. So if I'm in Phoenix and I'm walking down your street and my my plan is to rob your house and I get to the front door and I see the alarm sticker or the one that will really stop me, the NRA life member sticker, which <laughs> I'm sure you I'm sure you have there, uh, or I hear the Doberman barking, I don't go home and join the church choir. What I do is I keep walking down your street until I find one of your neighbors that looks like an easier target. Well, that's well said. My police patients have always told me that your house doesn't have to be safe. It has to be a harder target than your neighbor. So that's right. put up the beware a dog sign, put the alarm thing, put more stuff in your yard that the neighbor doesn't have and they'll hit his house. And, and, and that is so true. But the reason it's true is because as a burglar, I can choose my victim. As an embezzler, I can't. If I work for you, I only have one possible target. It's you. I am not going to decide, well, I'd like to steal, but really, it's too difficult at Howard's office. So I'm going to quit my job there. I'll go find a job with another dentist, and I'll invest the year to three years that it, that it takes me to learn their systems well enough and to uh, know the doctor well enough to be able to steal. That isn't how an embezzler thinks. What they think about is, if I can't steal that way, I will do it that way. And they've got lots of choices. I mean, there's a there's a porosity to a dental office that I think a lot of dentists don't appreciate. And, you know, they will think, for example, that if I just make some kind of policy, that will stop embezzlement. Well, who's going to apply that policy? Normally the embezzler. I was, I was speaking at a conference a while ago, and I was talking about how embezzlers cash checks. Because a lot of doctors think that, you know, cash can be stolen, but a check payable to the doctor's a little bit more difficult to monetize, and it's not. And one doctor was sitting in the back of the room, and he said, well, that would never happen in my office. And I asked him why, and he said, well, because we have a stamp that says for deposit only, and we stamp the checks. So I asked him a really simple question that pricked his balloon. I said, do you stamp them yourself? And he said, well, no, of course not. And my comment to him next was, okay, let me see if I understand this. Let's assume that you have an embezzler in your office, and by definition, they don't feel a huge compulsion to follow society's rules. What on earth <laughs> is she going to follow yours? And he had no answer. So there's a problem with prevention, and the problem is that, that you have somebody in your office who knows you really well, who knows what you look at and what you don't, and is quite willing to adapt to whatever procedural changes you might make in your office. So in that very unequal battle, my, my general suggestion to your audience is the embezzler will win every time. What I tell audiences is let's let go of prevention. Let's talk about detection. And how do we tech, detect embezzlers? Typically by their behavior, and it's those things I mentioned and the things that are covered in our embezzlement risk assessment questionnaire. Uh, and it, was called, it was called the um, embezzlement risk assessment questionnaire. Yeah, ERAC for short. And uh, I'll give you a statistic. This is not mine. This one comes from the American Dental Association. And what the ADA did about seven or eight years ago was they asked embezzlement victims how did you know that you were having a problem? And I think this is a great number. Less than two-thirds of victims realized that they were being embezzled because of some kind of financial anomaly. So their day sheet didn't balance to the bank deposit, or their CPA found the embezzlement, or something like that. More than two-thirds of embezzlers realized they had a problem because the embezzler was acting like they were stealing. So that's the far bigger target and I'd like to see your audience appreciate that focusing on how their staff are acting is far more likely to be productive and coincidentally takes a hell of a lot less time than trying to find financial anomalies in their practice. Okay, how are their staff acting? They don't want to take vacation, they don't want to cross train, they don't want consultants in. 
they're visibly overspending or in financial distress. Uh, they show preparedness to cut ethical corners. All those things. It's the it's the Iraq. That's what we measure. And we give people a score. And you're and, gonna and you're gonna post that today today on Dental Town. I'm gonna post that today on Dental Town. And will you email me the link? Yes, I will. Okay, because I've already emailed you to remind you. <laughs> okay. It's it, yeah. It, because it's easy. This, this, in case in case your audience want to get this some other way, I'll give it to them now. It's our our web address, dentalembezzlement.com slash e r a q. So two thirds of it was two thirds of this is going to be identified where something's up with Alice. She's not acting right in the head. Yep, my spidey sense is tingling because she's she's not acting the way I would expect her to. Uh, and then so, one third is going to be financial anomalies. Yes. Do you want to talk about that, or what do you want to talk about next? Uh, I'm not sure how, uh, how how much time we have together, but uh, we, uh, we are thirty five minutes down. We got twenty five minutes to go. She's only okay. halfway to work on her commute. Mo right. I, I, I get. I, I'm, tell, I'm telling you seriously, these are the hottest thing ever. I my uh, my first big big breakout thing was a thirty day dental MBA. That was like twenty years yeah. ago. That was thirty hours, but it was just me talking. Um, and, uh, I put up from 94 to 2015, we put up 325 online courses and they've been viewed 550,000 times. I've yeah. only been doing podcasts for eight months and they've already been viewed 150,000 times. Wow. So the, the deal is multitasking. the old world, you had to close your office and go to a course and that costs money and time and big commitment. Then it moved to online C, but I got to set at a desktop and commit to an hour. But now it's multitasking. They're yeah. sitting there and uh, they're sitting there driving to work or they're on the treadmill or they're on their bicycle and they're, and they're learning while they're driving. And I think it's just a really cool thing. What's making you laugh? I was thinking some of them are probably on the toilet when they're listening to this. but Someone you know. is pooping right now while we're talking about they're getting stolen from. So you got tw so you got 25 more minutes on this commute to work. What, what would be the next best... Uh, and feel well, free to go into overtime. This is hot stuff. I mean, you only manage people, time, and money, and this is money, and they don't they don't follow their metrics. So, just keep going. You got the floor, dude. Perfect. Love having the floor. Um, let's uh, let's talk for a bit about what a doctor should do when they suspect that somebody in their office is stealing. Um, because there are things to do that are instinctive, and there are things to do that are right, and they don't necessarily line up all that well. Uh, one thing people do is they call the police. And uh, the analogy I'll give you is, let's say that, uh, that tonight, um, and, and your audience probably doesn't know this, but we happen to be talking on a Friday. Uh, let's say that tonight um, you're out somewhere and you, um, you call the police and you say, I think somebody's stolen my car. And... The person answering the phone says, well, sorry to hear that. Uh, what's the make and model? And you say, I think it's a Ford, but maybe it's a Nissan. And they say, interesting. Um, what color is your car? And you say, I think it's gray, but, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe it's blue. What they're going to say to you next is, here's what I want you to do. Take a taxi home sober up, and in the morning, if you still can't find your car, <laughs> call us back. <clears throat> and of course, I, I tell this story and everybody laughs, but the point, the, the point of it is, it isn't really the police's job to tell you what's been stolen from you. You have to figure that out yourself. Once you know that, you can phone the police and they'll deal with it. But if you phone the police and you say, I think somebody's been embezzling from my dental office, I will tell you that no police department in the United States has the ability to open up your Dentrix or EagleSoft or right. OrthoTrack, follow the transactions through and find out where the money went. Correct. So um, calling the police is probably not your best plan at, at that juncture because you simply aren't ready. Uh, ditto for phoning your, your insurance company that provides insurance for employee dishonesty. Again, you, they're going to ask you 100 questions that you have no answer to. So let's leave those things alone. Um, <clears throat> what you need is somebody who knows how to investigate dental embezzlement and, and uh, 
we're in that category, but there are certainly others as well. How many how many's on your team up there? Where 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 are you at actually in Canada? Uh, well, he head office is in a place called Halifax, Canada, and we're we're on the east coast of Canada. So I'm looking out my window at uh, at, at at part of the Atlantic Ocean. So you're actually you're actually uh, east of Maine, right? Yes, yes, I am. Yeah, you're up Newfoundland. Uh, I'm between Maine and Newfoundland. You're between Maine and Newfoundland. That's right. And and you're also in the home of the most famous dental school university in the world, Dollhouse. Is it pronounced Dollhouse or Dollhousey? How do you pronounce Dalhousie, it? Dollhousey. Yes. Uh, Dal Dollhousey. Dalhousey. Yes. Dalhousey, the most famous dental school of the 21st century. Where yeah, the they're, not, were... they're not terribly happy about that either. Yes, uh, Dal Dalhousie University is here, um, and, and for reasons that I, I, I suspect a lot of your audience knows, they've uh, been in the news a fair bit lately. Bunch of stupid testosterone boys posting uh, girly pictures of their classmates, was it? Something uh, like that? I don't think it was girly pictures. I think I think most of it was just discussion, and you know, some of it was uh, relatively graphic about... Uh, so it's just discussions, no photos? Um, I haven't seen the post, but as far as I know, that's what it is. So, um, so then, so that's if, where if, if, this, if this dentist, so now do you do that? What, what is it called when uh, I call my IT guy and he has me log on to a website, then he's inside my computer and then he takes over my mouse. What's that called? Uh, remote access. Yeah. yeah. Do you, now can they call you? Can you remote access their Dentrix, Eaglesoft? Uh -huh. Open down. It's, it's a little more complicated than that, but yeah, the theory is we can do that. I, I um, mean, I mean, so if you're suspecting, is that the first deal? I called Dave. You remote access. You start looking at my, at my in my uh, Dentrix, my EagleSoft. Is that is that a step? Uh, that, it's, it, it's 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 a little uh, more involved than that. Well, uh, no, I'm trying. I'm trying to think. This guy's thinking this out while he's driving to work. I mean. Yeah. If he called you, do you need to fly down to visit? Do you need to come from Canada and be inside the the office? Uh, absolutely not. In fact, we don't want to do that. And and you, you've you've segued really nicely into what I want to talk about next. The mistake that people can make if they suspect embezzlement is to let the person they suspect know that they are in fact a suspect. Um, you know, if I'm stealing from you and I think that I'm about to get caught. The rules that normally apply to human behavior probably aren't holding me back at that point. So if I if I think that jail is in my future, I'm probably prepared to do almost anything not to go to jail. Uh, and I, and I'll give you a couple of examples that if you and I had hair would make it stand up. <laughs> um, I got a call about seven years ago from a dentist who had some embezzlement concerns. And we talked for a little while. Anyway, he decided at the end of the conversation that he could save some money if he did the investigation himself. What he ended up doing was he ended up tipping off the thief to the fact that she was about to get caught. So she came back that night and burned down his office. Now, was this Tom Petty? That Didn't his girlfriend burn down his house when he told her he was dead with her? Are you talking about Tom? I'm Petty or a dentist? I, I, I'm not. No, this is a this is a dentist because I, I I wouldn't work for Tom Petty. Um, <laughs> wow, not, she not because house. of anything to do with his, with his music. I like his music, but we we of course only deal with dentists. Uh, it, I I can beat that one though. Uh, in 2012, a woman in Anne Arundel County, which is just outside Baltimore, Maryland, pled guilty to mur to murdering the dentist from whom she'd been embezzling. Uh, no, are his, you serious? I'm serious. His name was Dr. Albert Rowe. Uh, she is Shantae Joyner Hickman, and she was embezzling. She thought she was going to get caught, so she came can back. You, can you post these on that thread? Do you have yeah, I can. Can, I can. You, can you post that? Yeah. That is just batshit crazy. So she came in one night to the office when she knew he would be there. We, we weren't involved in this case. Uh, she came in. Brought, uh, brought some muscle, who was her, her cousin, whose name is Dante Jeter, and the two of them dragged Dr. Rowe into the bathroom in his office and beat him to death. The amount of embezzlement, though, and this is the part that's, that's nauseating, $17,000. I know. Um, so the biggest mistake somebody can make is to tip off the suspect for two reasons. I mean, if, if they're right about embezzlement, then... They don't want to prompt that kind of retaliation. And if they're wrong about it, which happens sometimes, 
Uh, if, if, if you tell somebody, I don't trust you and I'm going to bring in an auditor, I mean, you can never work with that person again. Well, I think there's not too many people that know dentists better than um, I do simply because I've, uh, I've been on the Dental Tom message boards four or five hours a day, seven days a week since 1998, watching thousands of them talk. So let's get, I'm going to cut right to the chase. That dentist who's part scientist, part physicist, part mathist, part engineer, he's always going to try to save money. That's yep. why Las Vegas, they don't cater to dental conventions. You know in Las Vegas, when you tell them you're having a dental meeting, they look at you like, oh, my God, get out of here. I've had a yearly meeting every year. No one's catering to a dental meeting because if you're a physician, a dentist, a lawyer, an engineer, you're not going to go throw all your money away at blackjack. They want rodeo bowlers. They want, you know, they want uh, bowling leagues. They, they want yep. people that are just going to come put their whole paycheck on blackjack. So the dentist is thinking, well – it's going to cost me an arm and a leg to fly David all the way from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada to my office in L.A. So how much does that cost? If I, if I, think, if I think Wendy is embezzling from me and I don't want to tip her off and I call you, what's stopping them from calling you is the unknown of what is this going to cost? Well, let's, let's talk about that. First of all, we, we very seldom visit anybody's office. Usually when we do, it's, it's because there's some factor that prevents our, our normal methods, which are, which are designed to be done at a distance, done through the cloud. There's some factor that prevents that. For example, there are still dentists out there who don't use computers. I mean, they're on the old pegboard system that was around when you, when you started in this game. There's no way to investigate there except to put somebody on site. Now, I'll mention, too, our investigators live all over the continent. So if you are in California, well, in fact, we have an investigator who lives in California. So if we really, if we have, if we have to put somebody on site, we could, but but that's not our normal method of operation. So what? Is, so first of all, where are your other centers? Where where do you have other warm bodies? Oh God, they're all over. Uh, Texas, California, Georgia, Virginia, Illinois, Colorado, um, and I'm, I'm I'm missing a bunch. Uh, we. we we currently have 12 investigators, and, and, you know, they can live anywhere. And do you think they're embezzling from Dennis in Colorado more now that they're all legally stoned and they're just coming into work every day getting high? <laughs> well, I, I, actually, I was in Colorado last week speaking, and, yes, I certainly got the feeling that some, some embezzlement is going on there. <laughs> so, um, so, so then what is – so, again, more specifically, what is – I think Wendy's stealing – yeah. And I called David. I email him David at dentalembezzlement.com with two Z's, or I go to your website, dentalembezzlement.com, contact. And what what's the first thing you're going to do? Well, I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to try to understand what's going on. Um, so, you know, we start there. I'll, I'll explain a little bit about our process and costs. You, you asked about cost. Investigations start at $5,000. They could cost more sometimes considerably more depending on the on the situation but a, a a solo dentist one hygienist kind of practice yeah it's probably five to seven thousand dollars for us to take a look at their practice and the, and, and, and i'm sorry to interrupt you right there five you know, to seven thousand dollars and what percent of the time does a dentist give you five to seven thousand dollars and he was in fact right he or she's being embezzled against what, uh, it, what are the odds it, it depends why they call and i i, I I'm a little hesitant to give a global answer because people right. call us for different reasons. I mean, some, some people call us and they've caught somebody red-handed already and they want us to, uh, you know, to investigate and, and, and find the, the fullness of what happened to them. So in those cases, it's 100%. Some people at the other end of the spectrum call us and they don't really suspect embezzlement, but they've, they've seen the odds and they want to sleep at night, so they want to use a, a word out of the dental lexicon. They want kind of a prophylactic investigation. In those cases, we find embezzlement about 20 to 25 percent of the time, which I still think is a surprisingly high number. And then we get the people who are seeing red flags; their spidey sense is tingling, and they uh, they want to confirm their suspicions or or find out that they're all wet. But if you said at the beginning that um, if I have 7,000 listeners, it's probably 500 being embezzled from six to eight percent. But if they call you. It's 25%, and I made that comment about I think 100 years now they're going to find that just like this iPhone would have got me drowned as a witch in Salem 100 years ago. So if they're, if they're intuitively feeling that this is an issue, it sounds like enough to call you. You're saying it's a one in four chance 
If they, if they haven't caught anybody, they haven't busted, but they just yeah. have enough feeling to call you, it's a one in four chance. Now, do I have to give you the 5,000 to find out I'm the three in four or not? Or how, I have to give you 5,000 for you to do the whole prophylactic diagnosis investigation? Um, you know, our w w we have to go through a certain amount of work whether right. we find embezzlement or not. In fact, often we go through more work when we don't find embezzlement because... You keep looking. Yeah, because we keep, you know, a, a lot of our investigators are, are, are kind of obsessive compulsive disorder kind of people. And, you know, they want to find it. So they will... They will go beyond what we have agreed with the client we will do typically. So, yeah, investigations where we don't find anything can be more work. We're not in a, in a situation where we can accept some kind of contingency fee, you know, based on what we find right. or what's recovered or something like that. That, that just doesn't work. Right. So, um, so, and so I'm sorry I'm dumb, but um, so what percent of this is long distance to the cloud and when does it switch to a body needs to come in my office? Uh, we do site visits less than f in less than 5% of the investigations we do. Wow, I would not have guessed that. Um, we've, we've worked really hard to build a cloud-based methodology. Explain it. Well, here's what happens. If, if, if you say you have suspicions, then what we will do is we will build what we call a, a forensic clone of your practice management software. So uh, what are you using in your office, just to ask the question? Soft end. Okay, so what we do is we will make a copy of your soft dent data. Backup? That runs on, yeah, a backup that, that runs on uh, a server in our, in, in our head office. Um, so it's, it's our copy of soft dent with your, with your data. And then you convert all the imperial math to metric? <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. Bad joke. Keep going. Most 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 of our investigators. I mean, our head office is Canada. Most of our investigators live in the U.S. Um, and and uh, one of them, you know, the the one who's assigned your file will connect into that server that has that has your uh, your data on it. Of course, we also gather some other things from you. I mean, we want bank statements and what are called merchant terminal statements from your credit card machine and stuff like that. We 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 get some other stuff outside your practice management software, and then they work through your stuff looking for the type of pattern that is consistent with embezzlement. Um, and, and when we're doing one of our prof prophylactic investigations, there are about 20 or 25 patterns that we're looking for. Um, and um, they, they work through and look for those things, and if they find them, then uh, they ring the alarm bell in the office and let you know. Now, you have the 35-question embezzlement risk analysis question. Do you have the 35-pattern embezzlement pattern list? Um, we absolutely do. That's not something that we will make public. Because uh, then it'd be a training manual? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the behaviors I'm not concerned about because thieves can't suppress these no matter how badly they want to. Um, so I'm okay to make those public. In terms of what we look for in embezzlement, no. That's, uh, that's something I'm happy to discuss with a dentist in private, but I'm just not going to broadcast that. Mm -hmm. Could you teach me and then hire me to come work for you? Just um, well, because then I could run back from Canada to America, and you can't catch me as soon as I cross the border. <laughs> we're always looking for good people, Howard. So uh, yeah, you know, if you want to submit your application, we'll uh, we'll give it careful consideration. So you were saying most of your business in the United States is not Canada. Is that because the Canadians are too polite to steal? Oh no, they st they they still steal. They're just uh, they're just nicer about it. Um, it's just a factor of population. I mean, there are roughly twelve times the number of dentists in the United States that there are in Canada. How, how many dentists are in Canada? Uh, 17,000 last time I checked. Is that all there is up there? That's it. I heard another stat. And is, do you believe this is true, that 90% that of Canadians live within 100 miles of the U.S. border? Oh, it's very true. Wow, so uh, if you just live to that border 100 miles, then Canada would basically just be, what, just uh, forest and trees? and I mean, it's a huge... Yeah. It's like, how much bigger is it in the United States as far as land-wise? Um... I think it's about 140% as big as the U.S. Yeah. I still think the prettiest, having gone to 50 countries, I still think the prettiest part on Earth, most people don't realize it, but um, that um, your West Coast is a rainforest. It is. And from Seattle to Alaska is a, is like a several hundred mile long rainforest. With, that's the prettiest country I've ever seen anywhere. 
it, it is it is absolutely beautiful. I'll, I'll I'll lay out one more for you. Where I live in Nova Scotia, I live south of about twenty percent of the lower forty eight. So I am south of Seattle or Minneapolis or. Um, I've never lectured in Nova Scotia. Yeah. Yeah, score me a, a speaking gig up there. I'd like to come up there and speak and just hang out and see your place. And uh, um, now of the of um. I've only got you for five more minutes. So what would be the best use of your time for your five-minute close? What I'll say to Dennis is this. First of all, there's a lot of misinformation on this problem. and That's because you haven't made an online CE course on Dental Town, okay. even though well, I have over half a million views. Okay. Come on, right David. Now. Right now, publicly, I'm committing to do it. Yeah, that was worth the whole. That was worth the whole podcast. I will, I, I, I will do a CE course for you. We're going to be very careful because you don't want to train uh, everyone. I, I have this recurrent nightmare about turning thieves into better thieves, and I, I, I will not do that. But I think we can we can find enough to talk about that I can that I can make an online CE course. Um, but there's a lot written on prevention, and as I say, I think. I think prevention of embezzlement is a myth. Detection is, is much easier than people make it out to be, but prevention is a, is, is a mugs game. So that's the first thing I'd tell dentists. Uh, the second thing I would tell them is they need to be better at watching how their staff act because when somebody's embezzling, the clues are there. And we have so many embezzlement victims who kind of keep smacking themselves on the head, and as you know, that contributes to baldness. Um, because the handwriting was there and they didn't want to read it. So the second thing I'd say is if your spidey sense is tingling, do something about it. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in that. When you say that to people, like they think you're a quack, like ESP or whatever, and I always go to the cell phone analogy. I say, well, 100 years ago, no, you explained a, a cell phone radio wave. No one would have got it. And I just think that some people are really intuitive. Poker players say that. They yeah. say that you looked at a card and your nostril barely flared and that meant anger. You didn't like what you saw. You know, they, they just so are so intuitive. And that's why the people that are playing, they have sunglasses on and a hat and try to keep a straight face and all that kind of stuff like that. So if you think it or feel it, your, your, yeah. body's, your body's saying something. Respond to that. You know, don't, don't ignore that and don't hope that if you stick your head in a dark place somewhere that the problem will go away. It will not. Embezzlers... Once they start stealing, they continue to steal until they get caught. I, and I want to ask you another question. Is it um, – we have all kinds of different sizes of practice. Is it more likely to be an office where it's like one receptionist, one assistant, one hygienist, and one dentist? Or more likely to be in a big group practice where there's a lot of chaos? There's two or three doctors and there's 25 staff. I, I would say that overall uh, – I mean em embezzlement can happen anywhere. It, it, is, it is a random event. Uh, it is probably less likely to be caught in a bigger practice. And, and it is I know less likely to be caught in a bigger practice. Bigger practice. Because of exactly what you said. There's more activity. There's more noise. Um, I, I spoke last year at something called the American Association of Dental Group Practices. So this is predominantly people who own five or more practices. I think you've spoken there in the past as well. Yeah, and you're speaking for my orthodontist in Phoenix, um, Team Orthodontics Awatuki. Oh, okay. Uh, when is that? October or? Uh, yeah, it's in the fall sometime. I I, I forget when. I uh, hope, hope you can make it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, but I was I was speaking at the American Association of Dental Group Practices. So these are people who own five or more practices. And I was having breakfast with with a group of them one morning, and it was an interesting conversation because it wasn't about whether or not they had been embezzled. It was how many times. They'd all been embezzled. I mean, some of them three times, some of them five times. Um, and, of course, any time any of them gave me a number, they'd say, well, I've been embezzled three times that I know of. Um, and, and, of course, the implication was that there could have been more, and they're absolutely true about that. I mean, when I, when I ask you if you've ever been embezzled, there are only two answers, yes or I don't think so. Um, so, you know, the, the, these folks had all hap had it happened multiple times, and it was just the, a function of they had bigger operations with more staff, and more people coming and going, and 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 at, when you when you go lecture, when you go lecture, um, what is your favorite length of program? You like to do an hour, a three hour, a morning, a.m. You like to do an all day. What do you like to do? Um, for embezzlement, half day is good. 
Uh, I can so cover three the hours. Yeah, I can cover the concepts in three hours, and if I speak for much more than that, people really start to get down because you know you, when I when I lecture, you can hear about everything bad in humanity. So there's a there's a finite amount of that people can take. Well, you know what? Uh, it's counterintuitive. A lot of people have not put up an online course because they say, "Well, I like to speak, and if they see me online, then I won't be able to speak." And it's exactly so much success counterintuitive. There's 250 dental societies in America that are bringing in speakers. They're all volunteers. They get three dentists that raise their hand. They say, okay, find me a course in endo, perio, and something. The number one complaint of every meeting since the beginning of meetings was there was nothing for the staff. So for every dentist, there's two. There's a hygienist, two assistants, two receptionists. So they always want something practice management like what you do or, or whatever. And um, they, um, so these guys don't know what to do. So they go to dental town. Where, like, say I had to pick a, a Nindo speaker or a practice management speaker, and there's all these people who have a one-hour or a two-hour course, and yep. they just spend one weekend watching, like, okay, I'm supposed to get an Endo speaker. I had one guy that put up an Endo course and booked 76 invitationals his first year. Some of these practice management people are now doing 75 a year after their course on Dentaltown. So, so, what it, so what your online CE course, if you're listening to this you want to be a speaker, what your online CE course is, is your debut take. To the decision makers, you're going to bring you into a meeting, and if they, and if they can't pick you out of a police lineup, you're not going to get called. So you like to do AM PM? Yeah, well, um, three hours and and uh, normally normally when I speak on embezzlement, it's three hours. If people want a full day, then I have a couple of other topics I can I can talk about that um, use some of the the, the the knowledge that we have in other areas. For example, I do an hour, an hour and a half course sometimes called How Not to Hire the Wrong People in Your Practice. And we talk about some of the things we touched on earlier today about, uh, you know, how to properly screen applicants and how um, applicants will try to bypass your, your scrutiny. Um, and, and we have another course called External Threats to the Dental Office. And there I talk about things like hacking or um, medication scams, you know, the way that, that, that patients or, or others might, uh, might try to take a run at you. So if somebody wants a full day, I'll put those in as well. Well, we are. Uh, these are scheduled for one hour. We're at an hour and two minutes, so we're in a double overtime. Seriously, I want to tell you, uh, uh, thank you for seriously uh, being a townie. Um, you've uh, you've posted forty times, and they're, they're always um, informative and and to the point and succinct. You've committed to online CE, and uh, thank you so much for all that you do for your clients. Thank you so much for all that you do for dental town. And thank you so much for spending an hour with me on your Friday. Well, thank you. It's great. I'm, I'm proud to be a townie. I, I had a wonderful time when I, when I spoke at uh, the meeting and uh, you know, I really value my association here. Well, thanks a lot. And uh, I don't think I, uh, this is the 132nd one and you're absolutely the most handsome one I've ever interviewed. Uh, thanks. cousin. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.